Welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, I am very pleased to be participating in such a prestigious uh, uh, symposium, and I am very uh, pleased to be participating here with our uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, partners. Uh, I thank you, uh, Dr. Shalini, uh, Professor Kumar, Professor uh, Rajiv, and all the uh, the faculty. Of course, I thank my uh, my professors, uh, Professor Ines and Professor Hassanin, for giving me uh, the chance. If you allow me uh, to share uh, the presentation with uh, you, and uh, we will discuss after. A moment, just uh, can you see it now? Not yet. It's loading, I think. Yeah, yes. Okay. You can please put it in full screen mode. Yeah, I will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's ask the question why uh, hepatogastroenterologist would be presented in uh, a symposium uh, for diabetes. <laughs> because um, um, uh, in many uh, lectures uh, given by the professors, we are now uh, aware about the multidisciplinary approach of our uh, patients and um, uh, there is very, very big amount of, uh, of uh, patients in our GI clinics who are originally uh, coming to visit us from the uh, diabetes or the endocrinology uh, clinic with long-standing GI complaints. And maybe also your patients in your own clinics, they are uh, complaining all the time from GI uh, disorders. Uh, and you, of course, as internists, before becoming uh, endocrinologists and epidemiologists, you would try to uh, explain to them why those GI complaints are coming uh, from. So uh, I come here to uh, shed some light on a very uh, underdiagnosed and undernoticed problem, which is the exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, uh, in uh, and its relationship with uh, diabetes uh, mellitus. This is, is going to be my uh, agenda. And uh, let us not waste time in it. You will know it all. This is the pancreas. Of course, the pancreas uh, is, uh, is uh, spread between uh, uh, two uh, specialities and does not know who is the father. Is it the endocrinologist? <laughs> <laughs> because uh, pancreas is an endocrinal <laughs> organ, and when an endocrinal society wants to make a logo for itself, it will uh, definitely pick the pancreas as their logo. Uh, on the other hand, there is the gastroenterologist, of course, who thinks of the pancreas as because of its exocrine function, that is when he performs uh, another society, the gastroenterology, he will also use that pancreas as a logo. So there is some debate about whether the pancreas is an endocrinologist problem or a gastroenterologist problem. So I said to myself, why not make this happy marriage between the endocrinal and the exocrinal part? between the endocrinologist and between the gastroenterologist. So my introduction, of course, all of you know that the pancreas is an exocrine and endocrine uh, gland. The exocrine part is uh, the most important part in our digestion. Actu actually, our digestion uh, uh, depends uh, uh, primarily on the pancreas. And if you don't have a well-functioning pancreas, Unfortunately, sir, you will not digest because the pancreas is responsible for the digestive enzymes that can digest carbohydrates, fats, and the proteins and neutralizes the acidic chyme that is coming from the stomach. Moreover, the exocrine pancreas, the part I'm speaking about, is comprises 85% of the pancreas. So it is uh, the majority of the pancreas is an exocrine uh, gland. So how they interplay together? They, do they have something to do with each other or they are just neighbors in the same neighborhood? No, sir, they have very much interplay to do with each other. Uh, endocrine endocrine uh, islet cells, hormones, regulate the ductal and acinar cells uh, of uh, the exocrine activity. How is that? Uh, the insulin is a tropic 
or trophic key to the ductal and acinar uh, uh, exocrinal activity. How is that? Rise of insulin and other pancreatic pilot peptides like amylene, C peptide, and urocotin 3 following the postprandial glucose rise will actually stimulate the exocrine pancreatic function to start performing its job. Also, the increase of glucagon will do the other way around. It will depress the pancreatic enzymes and juice secretions. While the ductal and acinar cells, they affect the physiology of the endocrinal pilot cells through the cytokines and growth factors uh, uh, that they can secrete. So what is the definition of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? It is the inability of the pancreas to secrete enzymes and bicarbonates for the action of uh, uh, on the intestinal human to accomplish the normal digestion of food like I uh, formerly uh, mentioned. How is that uh, uh, be done? Uh, mechanisms of endocrine, uh, of endocrine insufficiency uh, can be um, uh, by uh, abolishing any uh, uh, point of the digestive chain of the exocrine uh, pancreas by insufficient activation of pancreatic uh, secretion, by damage of the pancreatic uh, cells, which reduces the production and secretion of pancreatic tools by asynchrony. Asynchrony means that the food is present in the intestinal human uh, at a time where the pancreatic enzymes are not uh, present and the other way around, uh, the pancreatic enzymes will reach the intestinal human when the food is not there uh, at that time. And this happens, for example, with uh, bariatric uh, surgeries or the bypass surgeries. Uh, and least, lastly is uh, obstruction of the pancreatic tools by any problem that obstructs the pancreatic uh, uh, so, what's the relationship between exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and diabetes? Uh, here is the first fact. 50% of patients with type 1 diabetes, they have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So, among every two patients with type 1 diabetes, there is one of them already complaining of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And why is that? Because lack of the trophic action of insulin and possibly glucagon and somatostatin on acinar cells, like we said, involvement of the exocrine tissue in the same autoimmune destruction of the islet cells, the autoimmune cells who are going to destroy the islet cells will not leave the exocrine part alone. It will destroy the, uh, uh, the exocrine pancreas as well as well as the autonomic diabetic, diabetic neuropathy leading to interior pancreatic reflex impairment. It means that when they have this kind of autonomic neuropathy, those, uh, 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 supply, those uh, reflexes that allows the exocrine pancreas to start to secrete its juice is going to be impaired. And lastly, the hypoxic sufferance, like, like any diabetic, having a micro and macrovascular disease, all his tissues are hypoxic as well as his pancreatic tissue because of the microvascular damage. What about type 2 diabetes? Type 2 diabetes, that 35% of patients, they are having exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. I mean, every three patients with type 2 diabetes, one of them is suffering from exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and this is because of the autonomic diabetic neuropathy and the hypoxic sufferance uh, um, uh, theories uh, uh, only. So what are other causes? Of course, you know it better than me. A chronic pancreatitis, pancreatic malignancy, uh, uh, congenital diseases like cystic fibrosis, any uh, disease that can obstruct the pancreas, non-pancreatic causes like celiac disease, it's a very common, and celiac disease is common in type 1 diabetes as well, we know it very uh, well, Crohn's disease, autoimmune pancreatitis, Zollinger, Ellison, and uh, surgical procedures uh, that will make the asynchrony between the uh, pancreatic juice and the presence of food. So, According to that, there are proposed subgroups of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. Uh, um, they are divided according to the etiologic factor. 
we say that there are some factors that are definitely to cause pancreatic insufficiency like pancreatectomy and chronic pancreatitis and cystic fibrosis and so on. Others that are possible to cause pancreatic insufficiency like gastric surgeries or, uh, uh, or uh, mild uh, chronic pancreatitis uh, 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 or post pancreatitis or weapon disease and things that are likely like the functional disorders like the irritable bowel uh, uh, syndromes but they have less amount of uh, causing exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So what is the prevalence of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? Unfortunately, it is unknown. Why it is unknown? Because doctors, they don't think about it, so they don't search for it. So you, they, you diagnose it very, very less than it should. So you cannot uh, 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 say the prevalence of a disease that you don't uh, diagnose. Uh, uh, but it has a very high percentage among the diseases, as we said uh, for our uh, lecture today, that in type 1 diabetes is 50% and in type 2 uh, diabetes is 35%. And uh, like patients with chronic pancreatitis, it's almost this time that we'll, they must develop uh, 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 exocrine pancreatic uh, insufficiency. What about the clinical presentation? How could we suspect? exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Unfortunately, the uh, uh, symptoms of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency are very common and they do not uh, almost occur unless there is less than 10% of the exocrine pancreatic function. The most common is steatorrhea. This is a very late uh, presentation of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, but what is commoner than that and occurs a little bit earlier than that are the symptoms of dyspepsia, occasional diarrhea, meteorism, uh, distension, uh, malabsorption, and maybe uh, uh, while examining the patient, you would find that he's having some sort of uh, uh, vitamin deficiency, of course, uh, um, mainly the vitamin, uh, uh, which are fat soluble vitamins like vitamin E, D, E, and K. Uh, malnutrition can lead to sarcopenia, and of course now we are speaking about sarcopenia uh, very much, and we are seeing that even obese patients they can be uh, sarcopenic. So they don't need to be losing weight to become sarcopenic. They can simply be malnourished to be uh, sarcopenic. Also, there is an increased incidence of all other comorbidities like osteopenia and osteoporosis and non traumatic fractures, like the increased risk of cardiovascular events. Or, already diabetes is a cardiovascular event. The presence of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency may multiply this risk of cardiovascular event. And of course, there is some sort of immunocompromisation. So they are very uh, prone to uh, concurrent and intercurrent uh, uh, infections, uh, those patients with combined diabetes and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So, how can we diagnose it? There is combination of two out of three. Symptoms of maldigestion or malabsorption, indicator of a malnutrition, and a positive result of a non-invasive pancreatic test. How is that? This is the way uh, it goes. If we have an exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, definite the, uh, 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 etiology, like we said, severe chronic pancreatitis or total pancreatectomy or, so, uh, or cystic fibrosis. I don't need any diagnostic test. I don't need any kind of investigations. This is uh, a, a definite exocrine pancreatic uh, insufficiency. And of course, these, those patients will definitely develop also diabetes, uh, what we uh, all uh, known before by uh, the pancreatogenic diabetes mellitus or type 3C uh, diabetes. Uh, this is a term that we use less uh, nowadays. Uh, what about the possible and unlikely? Those are the patients that they need uh, some investigations. As we said, clinical presentation, nutritional markers, and indirect pancreatic tests. If we have the clinical presentations and the nutritional markers or the uh, clinical presentation and the indirect uh, uh, test or uh, uh, the nutrition and indirect, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, we say that it is uh, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency possible uh, to say it. Unlikely if we, we have only the indirect uh, uh, test uh, uh, positive without any nutritional uh, marker of uh, deficiency.
What are the diagnostic tests of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? We know that we have some considerations. Direct methods should be highly sensitive and specific, but they are invasive, expensive, and very time consuming and not readily, readily available and unfortunately variable among centers that prevented their standardization. And that's why they are not very useful. Uh, what about the indirect methods? They are less sensitive, but they are less costly, and they are, of course, easier. And unfortunately, they are not very widely uh, available, uh, uh, precise, readily reproducible diagnostic technique. Uh, that's why exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is underdiagnosed. What are the direct methods? And we can see that they are all of them are very different, like the 72 hours fecal fat estimation or what's called the coefficient of fat fecal absorption. This is the gold standard, but it needs three days collection of stool, 100 gram standard fat diet for five days, and you have to stop therapy. And after all that, it is not specific. We have the endoscopic and creatic function test which was um, useful only in early cases, but it is very time consuming because you have to collect the duodenal tools for a whole 45 minutes during an endoscopy. It means anesthesia for 45 minutes, endoscopy for 45 minutes, collecting duodenal tools for 45 uh, minutes. And unfortunately, after that, you cannot quantify the volume uh, 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 output because this only 45 minutes and uh, the patient is not eating and you cannot quantify. What about the cholecystokinin secretine stimulation? It is the gold standard in scientific evaluation. I mean in research and in research centers because it's invasive and complicated. And lastly, of course, the secretine MRCP test it's uh, by giving screen and having serials of uh, MRCP uh, images three minutes, seven minutes, and 10 minutes afterwards. And it needs more validation and it is subjective and it needs precise timing of uh, the serial imaging. And that's why it is not very uh, uh, common. And it's almost uh, uses were in acute and chronic pancreatitis and they were not validated in other etiologies of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. What about the in indirect pancreatic function test? The most common and the most widely used and the one that I usually use uh, uh, in my clinic is the fecal elastase one. It is uh, it, it is the gold standard. It's the much that it is most widely used. It's non-invasive, single sampling. You don't need fecal collection. Does not require stoppage of therapy. In fact, you can uh, you, you use it once, and you can give the therapy. Then you can monitor it again by uh, uh, ordering another sampling. And it is not very expensive. It's highly sensitive. Only this advantage that does not. Uh, very nice uh, uh, results when you have liquid consistency of your stool because it cannot be readily measured. And there are other potential causes of false positive like the bacterial over uh, uh, growth. And of course, uh, like calprotectin test in, uh, in, uh, in diagnosing um, uh, um, GI disorders, it has this gray zone between 100 and 200 micrograms. Uh, these are uh, a gray zone. It is not a positive test. The positive test is above 200. Less than 100 uh, uh, is a definite deficiency. Uh, what about 13C mixed triglyceride breast test? Of course, we know there are uh, plenty of breast tests to diagnose malabsorption syndromes. One of them is the 13C mixed triglyceride. Uh, it is uh, um, by giving um, uh, um, uh, a diet with um, uh, triglycerides, high rich in triglycerides, and with 13 C um, uh, um, uh, carbon uh, um, uh, particles in it, and then you measure it in the breast. It is simple. It is non-invasive. It can be useful to monitor the treatment response. The disadvantage is the false positive, because any patient with chronic liver disease or chronic lung disease will have a, a false positive result, and it is also non-specific and low sensitivity in the mild form of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. What is the treatment? What is the therapy? After you have this uh, clinical suspicion and you perform the indirect test and you can find it that there is a, a, a deficiency in the fecal elastase, 
what are the indications of pancreatic enzyme replacement or supplementation? Indications, of course, are weight loss or statorrhea and the persistence of symptoms of dyspepsia, diarrhea, meteorism, and malabsorption of proteins and carbohydrates, and of course, after exclusion of functional uh, disorders. Of course, it has no benefit in pain management in cases of chronic pancreatitis. We are only speaking about the supplementation for uh, improving the digestion and the nutritional status of uh, the patient and maybe a control of his statory. The goals of therapy, the main goal is uh, to supply the patient with optimal amounts of lipase to reach the duodenum with the delivered uh, food. The currently available forms uh, will uh, maybe um, eliminate the azoteria, which is the protein malabsorption, whereas it will only decrease the steatorrhea, which cannot be totally uh, uh, correct. The general measures, of course, is a lifestyle modification like any disease. Uh, let's like say avoiding fatty food, limitation of alcohol intake, cessation of smoking, and a consumption of well-balanced uh, diet, and maybe refer the patient to a dedicated uh, a nutritionist to plan the diet with your patient. Vitamin supplementations, of course, primarily the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. And of course, the gold standard or the main spray is the what's called the PERT or the pancreatic enzyme replacement uh, therapy. Long-term monitoring will focus on correction of nutritional deficiency and treatment of positive diseases if uh, possible. And we can see here, it is like uh, four pieces of a puzzle, lifestyle, PERT, follow-up, and diet. Uh, end points of treatment are normalization of fat absorption and correction of nutritional deficiencies. The typical indications for initiating the PERT is the progressive weight loss and steatorrhea, and the efficacy by increasing uh, uh, or increased by higher enzyme doses, by enteric coated uh, uh, supplement, and of course by suppression of acidity, so not to destroy those enzymes before reaching the duodenum, and administration of therapy during food. We uh, always instruct our patients to take the pills during eating, while they are eating in the midst of their already uh, uh, of their meal. So that when the meal reaches the duodenum, the pancreatic enzymes will reach the duodenum by the same uh, time. And by that, we can guarantee the synchrony between food and uh, the activated enzymes. How we can uh, measure the improvement? Of course, by the fecal anesthesia or by the coefficient of fat absorption and the serum nutritional parameters and the uh, abolishment of GI symptoms and improvement of the quality of life. There are uh, 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 six approved uh, agents by the FDA. Lipase plays the paramount uh, role in the uh, therapy. There are combinations of amylase, protease, and the lipase. These are the approved agents. Of course, um, many of you may be uh, aware of some of them. I don't know about India, what, which of them are present. And uh, in fact, in Egypt, we had the Creon, and afterwards it was uh, stopped from being uh, 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 being here. Uh, problems, of course, with, <laughs> with bringing it from outside. And now we have two um, uh, companies in Egypt. They are uh, uh, making the uh, pancreatic enzyme uh, form formulas, and uh, they are present in the market uh, nowadays. These are the different uh, um, Concentrations, of course, and we, as I said, we start by titration of the dose until we reach the optimal uh, result with our patient. And this is a form in, uh, of the syrup in, 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 uh, in uh, patients with pediatric population, uh, like uh, those with type 1 uh, diabetes. And of course, the consideration is, uh, as we said, administration with means uh, uh, increase the dose uh, uh, depending on the lipase, improvement of the body weight and clinical symptoms, and less stool fat uh, content. Of course, you have to allow several days, maybe a couple of weeks, before uh, moving on to the uh, new um, uh, dose. Of course, should be enteric uh, coded. And uh, there is the technology of many microspheres that makes uh, the birth effect uh, much uh, better. Of course, at least at least we start with 20,000 units of lipase, then we can increase the dose later on. 
uh, the adverse effects, effects of pancreatic enzyme replacement are very uh, trivial. Some of them are just some abdominal pains and cramping, and they are um, they can um, uh, uh, go away after a while. Uh, to less extent that they can cause some cough, some dyspepsia. Unfortunately, that they can also cause some diarrhea. But uh, all of those uh, um, are transient and not uh, much of a complication. But you have to cautiously use it in patients with uh, renal dysfunction and hepatic dysfunction, of course, and not very well tested among uh, pregnant uh, females. In a capsule, there is so much interplay between exocrine and endocrine pancreas. So exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is very, very, very common among diabetes. We said half of type one and one third of type two diabetes. Uh, it is largely a clinical diagnosis. So all of us diabetologists or endocrinologists uh, seeing so many uh, diabetic patients every day, we have to suspect exocrine pancreatic insufficiency as a cause of the GI complaints of our uh, patients. It's not necessarily that it is a bacterial overgrowth or the effect of metformin or uh, that is having functional GI uh, uh, disorders like a, a, a retinal bowel syndrome or so, please think of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and search for deficiencies uh, before the uh, era of uh, steatorrhea, correct the vitamins like A, D, E, and K, and of course the ministry is the pancreatic enzyme replacement uh, uh, therapy that depends mainly on libase, uh, at least 20,000 units, and you can increase it every couple of weeks according to the uh, uh, response. And thank you very much.